You are listening to the Quarter Transmissions Episode 57. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. Hey everybody, don't forget to come back at the end of the episode to have your ears bob after you've watched episode 57, The Enterprise Incident. We are your hosts, Jeff Hewlett. And Craig Cohen. Craig, how's everything? Very, very good. Very good. We're, we're into season three. Yeah, we're, we're plowing our way through. It's episode two. And we've got, uh, once again, we've got another special guest making an appearance here after the show is over to offer his opinions on why he loves this episode so much. Yeah, yeah, our good friend uh, Vernon Wilmer. Yeah, very cool. So we just had the Spock's Brain Extended that came out last week with April and Vernon, and uh, Vernon has graciously come back uh, to talk a little bit about this episode. But before we get to that, we have our Red Shirt Diaries promo for this week. This week, Williams decides to write a letter to home but a never-ending scream comes from the corridor. What is it? And will she ever finish her letter? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so, as we all know, uh, um, I can't remember the man's name. Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams is brought aboard the ship, right? Mm. And he does a lot of screaming in this episode. So we play on the fact that if your quarters are next to sick bay, and there's a screaming, howling man that's constantly going crazy, how would you deal with it? And, uh, of course, that's it. And the screams are played by myself. I was going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> were you hoarse after that? Oh, man, that was a difficult episode, especially. I think there were, that was one where I was like, we have to be able to do this in less than five takes or else my voice will be gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it sounds great, guys. Can't wait to see it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sounds like another good one. So excited for uh, tomorrow to, to see Dagger of the Mind. Yeah, and we're, we're all, they're almost wrapping up, right? Yeah, one more week after this, and that's yeah. uh, the end of it. So hopefully uh, we'll be hearing some news about when they're going to start working on some new ones. I think uh, I think they may be seriously considering doing the crowdfunding thing at this point. I'm pretty sure uh, Jason kind of hinted at that last time I, I spoke with him. Well, if they do, I would gladly contribute because they've, they've definitely proven what they can accomplish with uh, – with the limited budget that they were working with for these first 10. Yeah, I sent him the uh, Futurama shut up and take my money meme uh, <laughs> over Twitter. So uh, I'm hoping that he, he got the hint that uh, I'd be willing to contribute to this. So are you ready to dive into the Enterprise incident? I cannot wait. All right. The Enterprise incident aired on September 27th of 1968 with a remaster to follow on April 5th of 2008. All right, and acting apparently restless and irrational, Captain Kirk inexplicably orders the Enterprise into Romulan space where the ship is quickly captured by the enemy and Kirk held captive aboard their flagship. Excellent synopsis, and we will start our scene-specific commentary in 3, 2, 1. All right, so there's that familiar... Enterprise cutting through space, and we've got a McCoy medical log. Yeah, and some interesting music, by the way. Uh, yeah. Interesting score bits playing through. Yeah, I love the the McCoy voiceover during its opening sequence telling us about Kirk's overworked and stressed uh, personality changes he's been going through lately. And now, as we were watching Kirk being snippy and, and uh, kind of nasty to his bridge crew. Yeah. Yeah. Giving poor Chekhov the, the brush off. Yeah, it almost makes you think that, you know, we've talked about what a sort of modern day original series would be like in terms of continuity and stuff. I'd imagine that the the log would be a tool 
that writers would utilize a lot more in terms of getting inside other characters' heads. Yeah, that's you know that's true. We don't hear that device used uh, in Trek episodes very often. Yeah, and it, and it's such an effective tool and you know it's if you think about reality tv now and how you know the bulk of reality tv is sort of driven by those confessionals yep, yeah the confessionals. You know, that's basically what the log is oh yeah yeah that's a good way of looking at it i hadn't drawn that parallel before yeah i so, love how the neutral yeah. zone order <laughs> yes makes everyone on the bridge kind of look twice like wait a minute what what yeah. And you get the like the tight close ups of, of Chekhov and you got a little close up of Uhura kind of giving the fish eye. Yeah. And the thing I like about this setup is you're thrown right into this situation where it seems like Kirk has has really lost his mind. Yeah, more or less. And you, you don't really understand what's going on here at all. But I mean Kirk doesn't seem visibly uh you know, over the edge, but, you know, b- between B- McCoy's voiceover and the order to the neutral zone, the audience is led to believe, and here's Scotty actually questioning, like, yeah. why would Starfleet order us there? And Uhura's like, hey, man, we, we didn't get any orders from Starfleet. This is Kirk. So uh, the audience is kind of not sure what to believe. Yeah, yeah, and this is this is kind of a neat, uh, a neat sort of opening sequence or stinger for me because it really um, drops us into a, a situation we're not u- used to seeing in terms of, you know, a bridge that's sort of divided. Yeah, so we have, yeah, we have the, the crew and Kirk opposed to each other, and we haven't seen that for a little while. And something that I was wondering, and I'm, I'm sure neither one of us probably has the answer to this, but I'm sure some of these Star Trek experts in our, our listening audience would, when was the last time we heard about the neutral zone yeah in season one possibly um i'm trying to think if there was any klingon interaction we might have dealt with in season two that would have mentioned it yeah i'm wondering i'm i'm really not quite sure um Mm -hmm. i was trying to think maybe it was it in the in the previous romulan episode way way back it it's very possible yeah, Yeah, yeah i'm not sure yeah it's really um, recording the, these wrap ups and re- referencing back to things makes me think I or makes me wish I had kept a little bit of a a better score sheet. <laughs> yeah, I know. I I was thinking of trying to look it up, but I wasn't even sure how to go about looking it up. So yeah, I probably could have looked up the neutral zone and maybe it would have told me what episodes it was mentioned in. But uh, I, I didn't think of that until right before we sat down to record this. Yeah. So the one thing that I think is really interesting about this episode is the the fact that we have a little bit of a twist or a surprise in the sense that we we see that things are being done for a reason. Um, But then also you have sort of the mystery of who the Romulan commander is, Um, you know, before they before the reveal. And I think those are two really interesting sort of things that they do in this episode that really wasn't done too much on the original series no that's true great great point so you've got you've got some some questionable uh character moments that happen during this episode where the audience is left scratching their heads on both sides on the good side and the bad side so you're not really sure uh, where the romulan commander is coming from you're not really sure what spock is up to you're not really sure for a little while what kirk is up to so as far as writing was concerned i think this episode does a great job of of ping-ponging the audience around and and not giving you the full reveal until quite a ways into the episode yeah and this was an episode as we just saw that was written by dc fontana who you know had a a very uh integral role in star trek um we last saw her work uh from a writing perspective on the ultimate computer and we'll next see her work in a story um uh, by credit uh as michael richards for um, uh, that's uh, that which survives. Yep. Yeah. So uh, that's the one. Yeah, and it seems like she worked in tandem a lot with uh, the director of this episode, John Meredith Lucas. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Who also directed the Ultimate Computer. Ah, another great yeah. episode. So rolling and he back. Was, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say, and John Meredith Lucas was one of the uh, the only people that ever wrote and directed separately episodes of the original series. Ah. Very good. So rolling back real quick, I just wanted to throw it out because I don't think we really mentioned it. During the, right near the end of the stinger, 
we learn that the Romulans and the Klingons are sharing ship designs now. Yeah. So that was interesting. So you saw a couple of what appeared to be Klingon birds of prey along with the Romulan uh, birds of prey, right? So what the Klingon design ships under Romulan command have the bird uh, grafted on the bottom of them. So I guess that kind of denotes that they're Romulan and not Klingon. Yeah, yeah, that very sort of 60s bird design. Yeah, pretty cool because on the on the we've seen it on the bottom of the little Romulan ships before. Yeah, but I thought it was kind of cool. We saw right when we we were in this thing. There's a shot from underneath one of the Klingon ships pointed at the Enterprise, and you could see the bird up underneath. And that that was part of why it was one of the remaster effects. Yeah, if I had a conversion van, if I was driving conversion vans in the 70s, I think I would have put a a, a sweet, uh, you know, uh, that bird logo right on the the top of my my conversion van. <laughs> that would have been pretty cool. <laughs> And maybe the Enterprise on one side and uh, a bird of prey on the other. Who knows? Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, you can still do it. <laughs> you can still do it. They're still out there. I've seen them. You could do decals now. They'd look even better. Yeah, decals. And then who knows? Maybe the inside you could actually do sort of a Star Trek uh, bridge uh, theme. There you go. Or maybe have it, you know, uh, replicate Kirk's quarters. Ah, now you're thinking. <laughs> I like, or the inside of a shuttlecraft. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Cool. So many possibilities. So getting back to uh, what you mentioned in terms of the story elements here, the one thing that sort of clues us in as viewers is the fact that you have Scott, uh, Spock doing uh, very uh, particular things here, but you know Spock is a character. You know he's a Vulcan, mm-hmm. um, and and even the Romulans later will indicate that he he's not able to tell a lie. Mm-hmm. Um so you see all the stuff going on in this episode, knowing that Spock does everything from a position of logic, which really helps not get things completely balanced from a, a viewer standpoint, but makes you think that there's some kind of end game here. Yeah, that, well, that's true. But I, as, as I was watching this over again uh, to prepare for this, I, I was trying to put myself in the perspective of someone who was watching the original series as it was was airing and i mean knowing what we know about spock i think he he rides a very uh, a very tense line in this episode between what we know of him and making us question him yeah so uh i I don't want to go too far into that before we get to those actual scenes but there's some really great stuff that happens that even had me going wow how far if spock is actually doing this stuff because he wants to that's crazy but if he's doing this because it's his duty and he's doing you know, things that may be way out of his character for the sake of duty, even that's a stretch for Spock. Yeah. So uh, some interesting stuff. Now, something that this particular scene we're watching right now, uh, in watching it in HD on a Blu-ray, you could see that Kirk's hair is is not perfectly done in this <laughs> yeah. episode. Now, I, I wasn't going for a, a for a for a funny reference. I was yeah. thinking, I was wondering if that was done intentionally. Yeah. Uh, because he was supposed to be more stressed out and, and kind of like have a little more bedraggled and a little unkempt look. But thinking about it in the perspective of the 60s, no one would have seen that on the broadcast that went over the air because the quality was so, so far inferior to what we have today. That kind of detail would be lost. Yeah, but that doesn't mean necessarily that that wasn't the intention. Oh, and I'm not saying it affects the yeah. intention. What I'm saying is maybe people didn't weren't able to really realize that depth until recently. Yeah. Oh, no, totally. Totally. And and that's what makes uh, these these Blu-rays so great. Yeah. So oh. now we got the reveal of the, the Romulan commander yep. uh, as a woman. Yep. So pretty cool. She winds up being a really cool character. Yeah. Through this episode. And uh, uh, one, one thing I, I want to throw out as well before we get too far past it is that you know pro- uh, prior to this, uh, we learned that it would take three weeks – for the Enterprise signal to reach Starfleet Command yeah. from the Romulan space. So that's an interesting perspective on how far uh, the Romulan space is from uh, from Starfleet, because we've heard them contacting Starfleet many times yeah. throughout the series, and not very often do they have a timestamp on how long it takes for that signal to reach Command. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. Oh, totally. And one thing I really love about these Klingon and and Romulan episodes is when you're on the Romulan ships, I love the the 
the color scheme that they have. They have very defined color schemes that instantly alert you to the fact that you're on an alien vessel. Yeah, and they're not just repeats of other interiors. They actually went far enough to make them look distinctively different in certain aspects. Like this one looks quite different than what we see in the Enterprise and on space stations we've been on. Yeah, You, know, you have those kind of almost triangular orange-red uh, paints around the, well, the yellow door there. You've got that interesting lattice work uh, behind the commander. It looks like a shadow mm -hmm. and some kind of almost like a shutter, uh, sh sort of a, a purplish shutter. I, I love the look of it. And I think this is in, in today, uh, in modern times, this looks uh, cool on the Blu-ray. But to think back then, this was done specifically because they were showcasing color television. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, that's an excellent point because it does make you think that in today's design sort of uh, design age, um, it might not have been so um, or might, might not be done so bold. Yeah, well, that that kind of speaks to something that a uh, friend of the show, Steve, and I have discussed many times is uh, we both kind of feel that other Trek uh, series that came after the original series – kind of felt drab color-wise. Yeah. When you look at them versus the original series, which was very ripe with color, the other series are, are a lot of muted tones, a lot of grays, a lot of silvers, and, uh, you know, more muted colors. And, and, I mean, they're products of a different time, but yeah. I think the fact that color TV was so new back then and they were trying to do everything they could to uh, to, to push it over with shows like this and, and the, the flagrant use of color... Yeah, uh, I think it makes a, a very tonal difference between the appearance of the original series and every other series. Yeah, yeah, and that's something I, I haven't really thought about. I normally, you know, when you think about even a series like Enterprise, which takes place a hundred years before this series, um, you know, a lot of things you say, oh, the technology looks, you know, looks different, or the bridge doesn't look as '60s, but. To, to, to key in on, on what you and Steve have talked about, yeah, the, the, the use of color uh, is even different. N you know, not to say, I mean, 100 years is a long time, even in the world of Star Trek, but you'd think there'd be at least be hints of it. Yep, you would think, but they kind of didn't really carry that over until you saw the, the Deep Space Nine Tribbles episode, I think you, you saw, which was footage from the old series, but at least the uniforms made it in the proper colors. Yeah. So we just had a great sequence here yes. with Spock where the commander uh, indicated that he can't tell a lie and then asked him a question, which he sort of worked his way around and said, um, deciding uh, what uh, basically not to incriminate myself or, you yeah, know, he pleads the Vulcan fifth. Yeah, it's the Vulcan version of <laughs> pleading the fifth, <laughs> uh, which I think is great because it shows that having to tell the truth or not being able to lie isn't a crutch for Vulcans. That's true. That's true. And. I, I love the way that it's used in this sequence as well. So the the Romulan commander actually separated Kirk and Spock. She sent Spock out of the room, took yeah. Kirk's statement, in which, of course, he proceeded to lie about why they were there and uh, came up with all kinds of excuses. And during that sequence, it was a very interesting uh, script flip. So uh, the Romulan commander said, hey, listen, if a Romulan ship had an instrument failure and we didn't have a good explanation as to why we wound up in Federation space, what would your space station commanders do with us mm -hmm. so uh you know kirk is throwing uh throwing this lie on the table as a, as a way to get out of the situation thinking that uh, it's a good excuse like hey listen our ship instruments fail and we just kind of drifted in and you know expecting her to be like oh okay you, you can go but uh, she said listen man if it was if this if it was the shoes on the other foot you wouldn't let us go so easily and like, he didn't really have much of an answer for that yeah yeah but now we see spock kind of well, well, from Kirk's perspective, turning on him. Yeah. And a very tense moment here. And Spock is very calm and logical as always. And he is kind of letting the cat out of the bag that it was Kirk's order. Yeah. That that led them into the neutral zone. And great Shatner moment there, freaking out on, on Spock, threatening to kill him. Yeah, we almost have like what an, an enemy within type moment. Yeah, excellent, <laughs> excellent. Look at that! Look at that intense look on Shatner's face. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's like you know that made me think of the shot in Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan where he yells, you know, that Khan line. Yep. Um, they're very very similar um, shots and also uh, deliveries from Shatner. 
Yeah, it, it, actually, it's great. I want to get freeze frame the two right next to each other. They probably look pretty similar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I always sort of, you know, never really, you know, you see Shatner now in his 80s, and then you look at him on the original series. And it wasn't until we really started doing this show that I see more of the Shatner of today in the Shatner of the original series. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it, for me, it used to be a, 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 a much greater divide in terms of looking at him. But, I mean, I'm looking at him right here, and I see the, you know, the 80-some-odd-old William Shatner there. Hmm. You know. Well, I'll try to keep my eye out for that when I, when I watch. I don't think I've tried to look at it from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's aged very well. I oh, mean, of course, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing, I mean, to think— you know, even what two years ago when he was in his early 80s, he was doing that one man show that he's still doing right now. Yeah, he's coming back around again. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's really uh, it's really remarkable to see the the uh, the energy um, that he has as a as a performer uh, still. Absolutely true. Did you did you catch before during that uh, that expose from Spock that uh, you know the Romulan commander had threatened to torture? the truth out of Kirk and Spock actually said it will, the torture will not break Kirk. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's kind of a, you know, even in the middle of uh, selling Kirk out, he's still uh, singing Kirk's praises saying, you know, you, you, your torture may be pretty hardcore, but you know, Kirk can take it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. That's great. And you got Scotty playing hardball here. I love this. They lock, they're going to lock Kirk up and then, you know, threaten Mr. Scott and you got the Scotty in command hardball again. Yeah. On the enterprise that we love to see. Uh, Great, great stuff. And, you know, there's a little bit of a, of a little timestamp coming up here with Spock with that, I think is really great. So she's going to ask Spock how long he's been a Starfleet officer. And he's going to say 18 years. Uh Uh-huh. So now we've got a little bit of, here you go, right now, how long have we been a Starfleet officer? 18 years. So you've got some time stamp there for Spock's service years, which mm-hmm. is pretty cool. So some background info on Spock. Yeah, and he also indicates why he um, never got his own ship. Yeah, well, he said he didn't want his own command and then also mm-hmm. says the opportunities are quite rare. Yeah. But, of course, here's the Romulan commander asking the question that – I would imagine all fans and audience members would have asked themselves at one time or another, since Spock is a superior mind and a superior being, why is he not in command? Yeah. So uh, I think here's the case of the Romulan commander speaking the fans' minds. Yeah. (laughs) But we've also seen Spock uh, not be able to command the Enterprise efficiently in the past. Oh, man, the Galileo 7, Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Yeah, it, it, it had some disastrous consequences. And, I mean, in the future, we see Spock in command, and he does a much better job. So maybe it was uh, just a, a matter of time and tempering uh, that he was able to work in some of the some of Kirk's more human aspects uh, into his uh, command regimen, right? And, and yeah. not just be commanding from a cold, logical standpoint. He actually had to allow his human side, maybe, to, to come out a little bit. Yeah. So that makes and sense. Also, and also, with the lifespan of Vulcans, you'd think that, um, um, you know, it's it's you know, surely they they mature, um, at the same rate as us. But, uh, you know, the the way they develop in terms of how their life unfolds and their way of thinking unfolds, um, is a little bit more extended than the humans. Yeah, but yeah, perhaps. And Spock also has a bit of a unique circumstance. In that, I guess the majority of Vulcans grow up and mature and become, uh, you know, older on their own planet with their own people. And Spock yeah. is being uh, exposed to uh, humans for the, the majority of his lifespan. The last 18 years he spent among humans. So he's growing in a completely different way than than most other Vulcans would. So it's hard to even uh, contemplate his mental development. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah, And, you know, it's funny, as an audience member, if you've been watching this show since day one, or you're, you know, you're a fan today, seeing Spock considering flipping sides is something that would have to make you go, huh? 
Well, yeah. Something is either either Spock's losing it, or he's not the person we thought he was, or something's up. That that would be a red flag. You know, I think as a, as an audience member, as someone who's a who likes the show and and knows the character, mm-hmm. you'd have to think you you would want to err on that side of wow, something's got to be up. There's got to be something we're not aware of here. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. So this is actress, um, as the Romulan commander, it's actress Joanne Linville, born in 1928. And sh- around this time, she also had appearances on Gunsmoke, Hawaii Five-0, later on Barnaby Jones, and L.A. Law even. Mm-hmm. And she was in the 1970s movie, A Star is Born. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. And if we look at this date in history, <laughs> all right, we're at this I, I, again. <laughs> I hate to uh, have another baseball one, okay. um, but on that, on this date, September twenty seventh, nineteen sixty eight, um, Bob Gibson of the Cardinals pitched his thirteenth shutout of the year in a game versus the Houston Astros. Yeah. And, and if the baseball um, fact isn't enough for you, um, on that date, um, Hair opened at the Shaftesbury Theater um, in London, and it ran. 1,998 shows wow. um, before it ended its run in 1973 due to a problem with the theater. I believe there was a fire. Wow. Pretty huge. And this is pretty impressive because you, I, I don't think that you're a baseball fan. And no. You know these baseball stats. <laughs> I, I guess uh, since we're in the uh, the fall, um, the, the baseball postseason um, was happening. So I guess there was a lot of wow. memorable baseball stuff. So uh, – I assume next week we'll have either probably a World Series fact <laughs> <laughs> or we'll finally be done with baseball until the spring. Oh, great. Look, I love the look on Shatner's face. He is really selling it. Yeah. That that he's exhausted and stressed out. He's just kind of like staring off into space there, breathing heavily. Mm-hmm. Now, how much damage do you think was done when he sort of threw himself into that force field? Well, it's hard to say. He looked like he took quite a shock. Yeah, I mean, that's not something you can fake. It's just a matter of you you wonder how damaging that can be. Well, you know, I, it makes another thought come to my mind is that, you know, we've seen force fields before that just kind of block you from getting where you go. But now we're on a Romulan ship. This is a Romulan force field. And maybe their force fields are more like electric fences. Yeah. Than Starfleet ones. They're, they're made to cause pain if you try to escape rather than just to keep you inside of a room. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, the Romulans, I don't think, are as concerned with humane treatment of prisoners as Starfleet is. So I'm thinking that that may be an explanation, from, at least from my perspective. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. So, so we've got a, a really interesting situation developing here where, you know, the Romulan commander is saying, clearly, Kirk isn't fit for duty. Spock, you're, you know, you're next in command here. Um, and then you've got sort of the incredulous McCoy and watching this, you know, a, you know, after you watch it for the first time, you, you sort of see all these pieces being set up. But then it makes it made me wonder, at least, um, and we've got a, a, a big moment here that we'll we'll stop for, which is, uh, I guess, the first time we're seeing Spock do this. Yeah, this is the introduction of the mythical Vulcan death grip. Yeah, where you've got like the 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 scream without sound from Shatner there. Yeah, you, or it, from Kirk. It's almost it looks almost like a mind meld, but it's more like a you you mug the guy's face with your hand and then pop another hand on top of it. I guess it's supposed to be some sort of a a mental surge of some kind that just kind of overloads uh, the victim and instantly kills him. Yeah, and that so, was the death of Captain Kirk. Yeah, so that's what I was sort of getting to uh, before the death grip is. A- at this point, McCoy had to be in on things, yes? Well, yeah, this was a need-to-know basis. We're going to find out shortly here that McCoy didn't know about the plot or the plan until he beamed over uh, to the Romulan ship. So Starfleet's orders, I suppose, are very specific on who gets to know what and when. Yeah. And I, I love this ch- this chapel moment where... She comes in to see the the dead Kirk and witnesses his eyes uh, spark open, and then they immediately close again Yeah, in a reverse, like, reverse camera footage, right? Yeah, yeah, it looks like they rolled the uh, rolled the camera for the, the, the film uh, backwards. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Instead yeah. of just having him close his eyes again. Yeah. I wonder if that was something they added later on. It wasn't intended to be yeah. there. 
it almost makes you think that maybe there wasn't they didn't do the coverage for it and and they said oh well we need a shot of of his eyes closing again yeah oh and i love that nurse chapel knows that there's no such thing as a vulcan death grip yeah she called it out i I love that she has that kind of knowledge (laughs) on vulcans so that was great so one thing we've talked about as we started season three is sort of the um reduced budget that they were getting for the shows and i gotta say you know i mean granted we're watching the remastered version here so some of the effects are touched up Mm -hmm. but this doesn't feel like a cheap episode in in the sense that they're on an alien ship and you've got all these different uh and new sets um you've got the romulan costuming and then you have the makeup that we're going to see on shatner later i mean this really this episode doesn't betray the budget that the show was working with at this point no, I think that speaks volumes about the uh, ability of uh, the the sets to be redressed mm-hmm. and reused without the audience being able to immediately detect it. Yeah. And I, I think it's great that they can transform existing uh, Enterprise sets into alien ships and, and make them look convincing. Yeah. And the makeup, I'm sure, was, was uh, some other Spock years they had laying around. But they do a pretty decent job, and, and that's one thing i think that the hd uh blu-ray versions of these uh these shows kind of helps to bring out was that if you if you look when we see uh kirk with the the romulan uh pointed ears on the skin tone of the ears doesn't quite match uh the rest of his face so I, i don't know if those were ordered specifically for him you see how they're a little more brownish yeah. There, they don't quite match, but uh, they don't look bad. And I'm sure that when uh, this show was broadcast over the air, you it was undetectable. Yeah. But in this instance, they're pretty detectable. Mm-hmm. So this is probably another one of those moments on the, the series, sort of like we had last week with Spock's brain and the, the removal of Spock's head is sort of the the process that Kirk goes through to become a Romulan. Yeah, and McCoy is actually a plastic surgeon. <laughs> and instead of actually putting, uh, you know, kind of prosthetic ears on him, he actually surgically altered his ears. Yeah, yeah. To look like a Romulan. So. Yeah, which is another one of those moments where you think they might have gone a, a little a little too far. but Yeah, and it was done very quickly as well. Yeah, yeah, with no recovery time, you know, I mean. Nope, no pain, I, no nothing. Yeah, I guess in that future, though, uh, I, I guess the advancements in, in – uh, plastic surgery are, are probably so so far beyond what we what we know today oh i'm sure they, they don't really need to explain i, and I think that was one of roddenberry's uh, mandates for star trek is that we don't want to explain the technology we don't want to explain how anything works it just is there yeah you know we don't, we don't want to explain how communicators and phasers work we don't want to focus on the technology we want to focus on the stories yeah and that that held true throughout the entire series. And I think that really works for it because it gives us something to talk about, but it doesn't waste the viewer's time at, with overly complex explanations. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. And we talked during Spock's Brain about the fact that we're watching and believing the idea that Star Trek can happen. So for me, as, 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 as soon as you believe in that world, something like McCoy reattaching Spock's yeah. brain or converting Kirk into a, a, a Romulan um, really aren't as far-fetched as, as they, they should be. Absolutely. And I think that our conversation here and our conversations in the past are testament to that, that we didn't need explanations. We come up with our own Yeah. <laughs> to justify why it would be okay or why it would work or why it's not too crazy a plot uh, convenience that uh, he could re- reattach Spock's brain or transform kirk into a romulan in 10 minutes yeah and i i really like the fact that kirk seems to have done his homework here oh yeah and and he knows the procedures and the policies of the romulan um you know crew yeah absolutely he's able to quickly assimilate himself uh into the the crew of the romulan ship enough to dupe a, a romulan security guard into believing that he's an actual uh, commander or Rom- what was the the centurion rather. Yeah, centurion yeah yeah and they got some tranya going on here yeah i love the fact that it seems like they're having like a tasting party because in the previous scene they toasted and drank uh, a, a deep blue liquid romulan ale 
Yeah, and now they've got the Tranya. <laughs> yeah, they, she's got a whole high end uh, pairing tasting going on here. So the, the Tranya, this orange liquid pairs well with the orange cubes that you had on the red toothpick. So uh, I, I love this sequence, though. I think this is this is incredible that you're seeing uh, Spock Nimoy doing what Kirk is usually responsible for doing. Yeah, and, and that is kind of seducing. Uh, a female into uh, playing along and and kind of giving up the uh, you know what, what their original aim is here and, and distracting her from from Kirk uh, parading around the ship looking for the cloaking device and so I really think that this is particularly effective because as an as an audience member you haven't really seen Spock do stuff like this and this makes me really scratch my head because he's really playing to the fact that he's buying into uh, aligning with her and the Romulans and taking over the enterprise and, and flying it back and being a part of the, the Romulan empire. Right. I mean, and you know, earlier they said Vulcans are incapable of lying. So I, you know, you're kind of juxtaposed here. So Spock can't lie or is incapable of lying, but he's capable of obviously uh, playing a ruse or bending truths. Right. Mm hmm. So very, very strange, but interesting. And, and the fact you've seen Kirk do this before and he's quite suave and uses his, uh, you know, his swagger, but, you know, Spock is using her knowledge of Vulcans and, you know, the, her knowledge of, um, you know, his, I guess, vulnerabilities at this point or her, her perceived knowledges of his vulnerabilities in order to just string her along and make her trust him. Yeah. Just pretty cool. And he actually even <laughs> he's he's playing or saying that, you know, why don't we take an hour to just hang out together, <laughs> you know, and uh, go slip into something more comfortable. Yeah. These are some of my favorite moments of the episode. And I think Nimoy and Linville do such a tremendous job uh, working together here. And there's some really great acting on display. And and I I, I think Linville um, particularly does a, a really good job here um, in terms of, of playing this. Um, it, it's, it's a really interesting role for one. Um, and it's also really well written and well acted. And, and when you have that combination, you get scenes that are really, really great to watch. Oh, absolutely. This is wonderful. And it, because it's, it's so out of character for Spock. Yeah. And she plays it so well. You totally believe that she's falling for him. And, you know, she's a, a, in a very high ranking position. Yeah. In the Romulan government. She's got to be pretty tough, right? And to think that, you know, she's kind of falling for this Vulcan that she just met. You started, you, in the beginning, you were wondering if maybe, you know, she was trying to use him. But the more you watch this scene, the more you realize that there's something real going on there. Mm hmm. And I think that's incredible because we know that Spock, you know, has had the opportunity to do things like that before, you know, specifically with Nurse Chapel, and he's always shied away from it. Yeah. You know, but in this time, he's actually playing along with it. So are we meant to, and now, of course, we're getting the, the reveal that he is really just playing along because he's, he's communicating with Kirk and telling him where the cloaking device is. So we know that he's really not switching sides. Yeah, nearly 35 minutes into the episode. Yeah, like I said, we were saying it earlier that they really take a long time uh, to to flip it for the audience and, and let us know what's really going on here. And I think it to keep us guessing that long and doing it in such an effective way make this a fantastic episode of Trek. Yeah. So and that's another one of those things, though, you hear from people who are not fans of the original series say that, oh, it's so much talking, so much talking. But, you know, this is not an action oriented episode at all. But the, the dialogue and the sequences of, of and the way things are structured, it makes it such an interesting and compelling story. And it keeps the audience uh, moving along, even though you would think an, an all talking episode would be very slow moving. Yeah, it, it does effectively move along. Now, is this the introduction of this uh, Vulcan sexy time? Sex time? Yeah, <laughs> and we'll see it again, of course, in um, Star Trek three. Yeah, uh, but. I thought that was pretty cool that that they carried those things forward. Yeah. Uh in in other series. 
So we see thing, little things like that that you would think are kind of inconsequential, but they keep them. Mm-hmm. So very cool. Did they ever do any kind of um, Kirk as Romulan uh, figure? Oh, I'm sure they did. That would be really cool. That would be a, a, a figure to get. In fact, I thought I saw one at the convention. But it was one oh, of yeah? those Playmate style oh, okay. figures. I don't think it was a, a, an Art Asylum or Diamond Select style. Yeah, I mean, I, the, can you imagine how great that Diamond Select style would be? I have to look and see. Yeah. Because there are some that I, I know that exist that I've never actually seen in real life. But mm-hmm. I'm sure maybe I'll, I'll look at the, the site. A lot of them that I saw that were oddballs and rares were... You know, only produced for a short time and are now unavailable. So you probably wind up having to pay a good chunk of change for it. Yeah, like a Comic Con exclusive or something, yeah. something like that. Don't get me on the exclusives, man. <laughs> Not in the middle of a commentary. <laughs> uh, I love that we're seeing Spock going to Kirk like lengths to complete his mission. Now we know that he is not switching sides and he is still loyal to Kirk. But he's still kind of having Vulcan sexy times <laughs> yeah. with this uh, with this Romulan. So he's willing to um, to quote unquote Vulcan bed this this uh, this woman mm-hmm. in order to delay her from uh, to and the Romulans from finding out that Kirk is actually on board the ship. So that's usually a Kirk tactic. Yeah, and I like how Spock uh, completely sort of reveals himself yep. Here as you go. <laughs> as the person who was sending messages. Um, he indicates there's no deception there. Yeah, and he could have totally played it off, too. Mm-hmm. He could have said, hey, you know, the Enterprise called me, you know, and I was telling them to stand by and whatever. But he, he totally, um, he just handed it over. Yeah. Hey, hey Nomad, how's it going? <laughs> so this gets me to the point where... Nomad's disembodied head? Yeah, where you think about, this is sort of what, I this is the first episode where we see the technology that is the cloaking device. Yes, it is. This is the reveal of the cloaking device. And now we know that the, the Romulan somehow found Nomad and cut his head <laughs> off and put it on the cloaking device, which is actually, I think that is the sphere that was in the, um, uh, the name of the episode with the, the spirits that were in the, um, in the spheres that transferred into the yeah. Kirk and Spock's body. So we've got some reused props here. Yeah. But the, the thing is, do you think the Enter- or, or Starfleet is really sort of putting their thumb in in the dam, if you will? Mm. In the sense that you know that, that this technology is eventually going to become common. Oh, of course. But yeah. and, and only uh, and the funny thing is that Starfleet is stealing this technology and installing it into the Enterprise, but it's not Starfleet that winds up using it. It's the Klingons. Yeah. Are famous for having a cloaking device uh, in the future. Mm-hmm. And not really the Romulans either. Yeah. So uh, odd, uh, some odd uh, changes there as to what we would have assumed would happen after this episode. Like, you know, they have the cloaking device in the Enterprise. Why wouldn't it become a uh, common you know, common piece of equipment that the Starfleet vessels had. Why wouldn't the Enterprise just keep it? Yeah. Oh, totally. And Scotty's been tasked with having 15 minutes to integrate it into the system. Yep, so. another hero <laughs> moment. Yep. Another Scotty hero moment. Yeah, Scotty gets to do some uh, some heavy engineering lifting. Yeah, I think we've seen this console before, too, that Spock is standing in front of. Yeah. That looks familiar as well. Uh, and now we're getting the, the confrontation that... Uh, you know, Spock is, is, you know, loyal to his duty, and she's really incredulous because um, I think she's taking it very personally. Yeah. You know, that he played on her heartstrings, and uh, you're going to get a, a serious slap here. Yeah. Who are you? Oof. I'm first, uh, first officer of the Enterprise. Boom. Boom. It's a big slap. And, she, you know, she really sells it. I, I love how distressed she looks. Yeah. Did great job. Wonderful acting. Oh, yeah, she's doing tremendous work here, and I like how Spock simply matter-of-factly asks what their form of execution is. Yep, stone-faced. Yeah. Stone-faced. So he's perfectly uh, expecting that he's getting uh, the death penalty for this. Yeah. But we know we know that, that Kirk's not going to let him. No. No, Kirk's going to find a way to rescue him. And here we got some Scotty doing some work installing uh, Nomad and the Sphere. Uh, into the Enterprise to uh, allow them to cloak. And, and of course, the, the happy reunion with the bridge crew. Everybody's always really happy to see Kirk after they thought he was dead. 
Yeah. And it's funny. It seems like Sulu never takes his eyes off of Kirk's ears. Yeah. He's like, wait a minute. How did that happen? <laughs> and actually, Uhura was kind of giving him the stare down there, too. Yeah. Oh, great stuff. So now we're going to see Spock employ his knowledge of Romulan culture and invoking his right uh, to give a, a final statement, uh, the Romulan right of statement before his death penalty uh, is invoked, right? So he's he's using it as a, a delay tactic, of course. Yeah. But he knows enough about the Romulan penal system to ask for this right, which is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it, it it's great in this episode seeing that Kirk and Spock both have a a deep understanding of of Romulan, uh, you know, uh, order and custom. Yeah, they went to school on it, so yeah, of course well, it, it makes sense because they were yeah. ordered to to infiltrate you know Romulan space and Romulan vessels. So, you know, at least we know that Starfleet is very thorough. Yeah, uh, in their prep for these types of missions. Yeah, so it's it's funny here that the Romulan commander thinks that Kirk is still on the ship. Yeah, that that is interesting. They she didn't really. They can't detect that he beamed off. Yeah, they. I they guess think they, he's just running around the hallways. With the, well, I guess there's the no way. Romulan equivalent of Scotty on that ship. That's true. That's true. And you, you wonder how heavy that cloaking device is because Kirk was able to just quickly pick it up and tuck it under his arm. If he was running around the ship with that. Yeah, for yeah, for a piece of equipment that does such a, a magnificent thing. Yeah, you think it would it would have some some weight to it. I, I love how Spock is just rattling off, <laughs> you know, what is was almost like a you know, a bunch of babble yeah. about his duty and his how bound he is to it, and uh, he he did what he did to carry out his duty. And she's even kind of calling him out on it, like, "Listen, man, you're stating the obvious, Spock." Yeah, yeah, he's just buying time here, and I like the fact that you talked about the writers sort of doing their homework for Star Trek Three. Here we're going to get a moment where the writers of Star Trek IV oh. s- sort of took a page out um, when they have the dual beam a- that occurs. Ah, that's <laughs> well, true. That's true. Yeah. I didn't even pick up on that when I was watching it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it always sort of bothers me because we've talked about the inconsistencies of the whole beaming technology mm-hmm. and, you know, how they can, you know, sometimes they beam point to point using, you know, uh, transporter, you know, pads. Um, a lot of the times they just beam down to a planet surface and they can beam up without a transporter pad, which makes you wonder yep. why they even need transporter pads. But then also the fact that we have multiple instances where people beam together when they weren't expected to. Yes. And e- there are also more inconsistencies that are introduced. Here we go. She's jumping yep. in. But there are more beaming inconsistencies introduced in other uh, Star Trek series and the comic books even. Yeah. So when we get to the comics and things later on, we're going to hear some even crazier uh, beaming circumstances. <laughs> yeah. So I guess you're really not – again, as Roddenberry mandated, you're not yeah. supposed to question the technology. You're just supposed to accept that it's there yeah. Yeah. and that it works. Yeah. So Kirk seemed pretty happy that the Romulan commander was on board with Spock. Yeah, he did, didn't he? He's like, all right, we'll go with it. Yeah. We'll go with and, it. I, and you almost wonder if it was Sp- – uh, Kirk sort of – being happy at the fact that he's going to make the decision that he makes and he knows that it will sort of blow the Romulan commander's mind. Mm, potentially. I, and I want also, it was, I kind of wondered maybe for a minute if he thought maybe she was defecting Oh, or something. That's why he was so happy about it. That's a, that's an interesting theory. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I could, I could have seen that happening at the end of this episode as well. I could have seen her uh, being in on it the whole time. And at the end, she uh, she takes the opportunity to, to jump out and escape, you know, with Kirk. Wow, that would have been really some next level storytelling. Yeah, that would have been really cool, but it doesn't turn out that way. But I, I also love that that Scotty says that installing the cloaking device on the Enterprise was the biggest guess he's ever made. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So he's really sticking his neck out with technology he doesn't even begin to understand, and he he finds a way to wire it in, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the the Romulan commander is given the order to destroy the Enterprise. Oh yeah. Um so showing that not only captains like Kirk have the um you know the um the guts to order uh, make a command that will result in their death whereas we have the Romulan commander saying to destroy the Enterprise even though she is on it. Yes. 
Yeah, well, you know, I think that uh, they're they're more willing to to give up their lives for what they believe in, perhaps, than maybe most people would be. So it doesn't surprise me. The Romulans have always been kind of ruthless. We haven't seen them very often. Yeah. But every time we see them, they're they're very dynamic and very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know we we wind up seeing the Klingons becoming you know the main villains uh, in the original series universe and. Sometimes I wish that the Romulans played more of a role. Yeah. Because they're more of the cold and calculating type of villain versus the just the brutal, uh, you know, uh, ruthlessness of the Klingons. And sometimes the Klingons just are a little too uh, barbaric. Yeah. For me. So, so at any I, rate, I, we've yeah, got I the like cloaking device activated. Yeah. And it, it's funny that the, the Romulans sort of calculate where the enterprise should be based on its past location and it seems like the enterprise a- anticipated that and uh and did something differently yeah because we've seen that tactic used against other enemies that were cloaked in the past right and now yeah. uh, i guess kirk is using his battle prowess to think you know what let's get out of the way here because <laughs> yeah. they could just easily fire off a shot and wind up hitting us so i wonder i, I guess we don't we don't know if this cloaking device has the same restriction of not being able to fire uh, that we, we know of the Klingon cloaking devices later on, right? Yeah, you you, you probably assume that it would. Yeah. That seems like a pretty tough um, hurdle to overcome in, in, in terms of the, the uh, limited, you know, uh, functions of that technology. Yeah, and we don't see that overcome until Star Trek VI. Yeah, that's the first time we see a bird of prey that can fire when cloaked, and it's uh, it's pretty shocking. Yeah, so it's the Enterprise crew. So this is a really great exchange on the way out of this episode, and, and I guess Kirk specifically chose Spock to escort the Romulan commander to her quarters, not the brig. Uh, Kirk's being very diplomatic here, yeah, and allowing her to have her own quarters and not be treated mm-hmm. uh, as a prisoner. And we're going to find out here that Spock seems to have some sort of a genuine emotional interest in her. Yeah. Which is interesting. So he really wasn't playing along. Uh, He was playing along from a a duty standpoint, but he's also has developed some sort of uh, an interest in her. And uh, I wonder if this is one of those uh, star-crossed lover type scenarios. Yeah, where if things... If, if only things had been slightly different. Yeah, maybe if she had defected. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been Spock's love interest. They could have they could have had her recur here and there. Yeah. Maybe that would have been kind of cool. And I could buy that, actually. It would have been really cool to have a Vulcan and a Romulan in some sort of a relationship, right? Yeah. Th- that could that could have sort of been the um if they wanted to sort of go with the romantic angle of Star Trek in the movies, they could have made part two um, you know, Star Trek II, the return of the Romulan commander nah. <laughs> and have her sort of return to this as, you know, 15 years later as his scorned lover. That would have been pretty cool. <laughs> that would have been pretty cool. But I, I think I would have I would have preferred to see uh, her be some sort of a recurring uh, uh, love interest for Spock, at least have him um, have some sort of fulfillment for his human half. Yeah, and and that again is something that they would probably do nowadays, where you have the mm-hmm. the the need to sort of establish a a, a more fixed continuity. Yes, agreed. week to week, season to season. Yeah, and I would I would buy that relationship far more easily than I buy Spock and Uhura. Yeah, in the JJ <laughs> universe. I mean, yeah. I I understand you know where they're going with that, and, I, and I'm not against it. I just think that it would it makes much more sense, and there's a lot of tension. That could be uh, derived between a Vulcan and a Romulan uh, being in a relationship together because they are they do share a common ancestry, but they've developed into two completely different cultures who are actually opposed to yeah. each other. So you could have like a um, you know a, a, a Romeo and Juliet type relationship between them. Yeah, yeah, it could be very contentious. But so the episode is now over, and you yeah. know what that means? It's time to talk the essential nature of it. And I went first last week, so do you want to? Go first this time. Ah, sure. Well, this is a really easy one, isn't yes. it? I mean, yeah, I, clearly I not essential. No. Yes. <laughs> no. I, I can't see. Uh, I, I can't see many reasons why you could call this a non-essential. So, um, yeah, you've got uh, you've got the cloaking device, which is an easy one. Uh, you've got Spock's eighteen-year history 
in Starfleet called out here. So you get some some great backstory on Spock, one of the major characters of the show. Uh, you've got the the Romulans and the Klingons sharing ship designs. So you're seeing two major alien races are kind of tied together uh, using common ships. Uh, we've seen the the Vulcan sexual ritual that we see again uh, in Star Trek Three and and beyond. So uh, got a lot of great stuff in this episode and great great character moments. I think for Nimoy in this, I, I think this episode above many others showcases how dynamic he can be with what we normally know as a very static type of character. Yeah. Yeah, you you pretty much nailed all the things that make this essential and you know, you you see, you know, the the engineering might of Scotty again and even the medical might of McCoy with with what he does in this episode um, you know, related to uh, the not even the surgery, but also um, all the medical attention he pays to Kirk um, during his quote unquote death. So yeah, this this is a, clearly a landmark episode and, and definitely essential. Awesome, awesome, very cool. So we will have uh, some some additional commentary on this episode. Uh, yeah. After we're done and over with, so continue to listen. After our commentary here ends for a little bit of a conversation with Mr. Vernon Wilmer. Yeah, we always like talking to Vernon, and uh, I know this was an episode that he he wanted to talk about with us, so uh, it should be fun. Absolutely. Looking forward to to what he has to say. So uh, thanks, as always, for tuning in, and stay tuned. Hello. So we are back. As promised, we have with us a good friend of the show, Vernon Wilmer. Vernon, welcome. Thank you. So when we reached out to you in April about season three, you said that Enterprise Incident would be one of the episodes you wanted to talk about. Uh, what is it about the Enterprise Incident that makes it sort of stand out as being an episode that we should be talking about? There are many things about the Enterprise Incident that make it stand out as one of the best. The top of that list is... Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay, no, but it is the redeeming episode of the third season. As we all know, Roddenberry left, and season three was produced by Fred Freiberger. Not everybody loves the third season. And to be honest, compared to the first two, it's hard to watch. But that episode stands out as almost a season two episode for me, in, in the middle of this third season swamp where there's not much good to watch. And it's also got a lot of role reversal in the sense that Spock has the love interest, not Kirk. Kirk's the one running around doing the dirty work while Spock is seducing the high priestess, in this case, the Romulan commander. We have the introduction. Well, okay, not the introduction, but the rehash of the cloaking device, which for some reason in that episode, they kind of assume the audience has forgotten about the balance of terror. Right. Uh, but I think if you look at it from the perspective of, uh, say, Trek Justification 101, it's a different kind of cloaking device that was just invented that's better than the one in Balance of Terror. And, and it's great to see Nomad reused as another prop. Uh, it's the cloaking device. You see Shatner with pointed ear makeup, which is awesome. There's just the layers and layers and layers of awesome stuff about that episode. Abs not just one of not just my favorite of the third season, but one of my favorite of the whole series. And and don't forget, da, 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 da. that's awesome. Well, there's some remastered stuff that's pretty cool. Not only do you get the uh, you know the, the beautiful remastered exterior shots that uh, the Okudas and uh, Rob Rossi uh, not only gave us some beautiful new exterior shots, but they very cleverly made one of the three surrounding Romulan ships a, a bird of prey which still fits with the script. We still have the D7-type Romulan uh, Klingon knockoffs, and, but we also get a, a bird of prey in that episode. It's awesome. A Romulan bird of prey. That's definitely awesome. So, Vernon, I, I, you know, thinking on the Enterprise incident, something that Craig and I talked about a little bit, and I thought maybe you could shed some light on your opinion on this. So at the end of the episode, we saw the, uh, the, the Romulan high priestess uh, transport herself over to the Enterprise with Spock, and uh, Kirk grants her quarters instead of putting her in the brig and has Spock escort her uh, down to those quarters. And in the turbo lift, they have a little bit of a moment where I kind of felt like there was an acknowledgement that Spock did have some sort of genuine feelings for her 
Sure. It was a very, very well-written and well-performed moment. And Joanna Linville, uh, it was a great, greatly written and performed scene. Uh, I don't think they could have picked a better actress to go up against Nimoy, it, it, as far as love interest foil. Just a perfectly executed episode. Definitely, definitely agree. And I, I love the, the earlier scenes where uh, Spock is uh, playing the sort of half-hearted seductor and uh, he's sort of torn between uh, his duty and uh, performing things that he may not normally be comfortable doing. Yeah, because it was usually Kirk's job. Right. <laughs> the total, total role reversal. reversal. It was awesome. Yeah. You, you know, it's funny. Um, on our Spock's Brain supplemental, we talked about um, outrageous moments on the series. And I just thought of one for this episode that we, we talked about on the commentary track, but I'd like to get Vernon's take on it. The whole surgical modification of Kirk and how easily it's reversed at the end of the episode. Well, okay, we don't see it easily reversed. We see it suggested at the end of the episode. We, so you think he was in, like, recovery for weeks? I would liken it to uh, what became a, a casual reference on all the modern Star Trek series where they would just visit Sick Bay to get a quick uh, surgical alteration to fit in with whatever alien race they were going to go blend in with. Uh, I, I think that episode might be the seed for that whole, uh, that whole ink well. Yeah. I don't think it was all that outlandish. I think, uh, judging by the way the episode was edited, time cuts and whatnot, I think McCoy had plenty of time to make Kirk look like a Vulcan. And Shatner does not make a good uh, Romulan or Vulcan no. uh, alien at all, I have to say. I agree. But but it but it sure inspired a great line from Scotty with the big grin on his face. You look like the devil himself. Yes. But as long as you're alive, that was an awesome scene. Did you notice how happy everyone always is to find out that Kirk is still alive? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Spock in a muck time when he he comes out of of the of the room and sees uh, Kirk standing there and has that that wonderful reaction. And now you know Scotty who thought Kirk was dead, has that, that wonderful reaction to, to seeing him alive. So it, I, it speaks volumes to their, uh, their relationships with Kirk. Actually, one, one other thing, Vernon, I want to sort of ask you about, maybe from a filmmaking perspective, is the scene where Kirk is uh, in sick bay and he's, he's been brought back to the Enterprise, uh, dead at this point, and Nurse Chapel comes in and he opens I know his what you're eyes. Gonna say. Okay. <laughs> and, and then we get the reverse for his eyes to close. Horror. Do you have a take on that, or do you have any other information related to that? I uh, Okay, uh, Kirk's bringing his eyes open when he regains consciousness, which startles Christine, is followed up by a slow-motion reverse of the same shot, so he closes his eyes. Editorially unnecessary, and secondly, it looks horrible and fake. And uh, I thought the episode could have done without it. In fact, I was kind of hoping when they were doing the remastered editions, they would just kind of get rid of it somehow, but it's unfortunately still there. A lot like the Ewoks are still in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there are things that the editor and the director need sometimes that unfortunately don't make it into the film can. Yeah. And the editor has to be clever, go back through what he has, screw with it until it, you know, turns into something. But I don't think Kirk closing his eyes again necessitated that horrible effect. I think we could have done without it. Yeah, yeah. especially if you have McCoy walk back in and see him, his eyes closed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they could have just done like a scissor edit, you know, to a wide shot that they had, and they could have had his eyes closed again or something. Good call. Yeah. And uh, again, stage lights. Um, <laughs> you, you think Kirk's dead because there's a green stage light washing his face. <laughs> but then, of course, it turns blue, which uh, and then red, which brings him back to life. That's all it takes, huh? Mm hmm Sargon. Ah, yeah. So if, if anything ever happens to you, Craig, I'm just going to take you to a fast food restaurant and stick you under the heat lamps, and you'll come back to life. <laughs> nice. All right. <laughs> all right. So I think, Vernon, are there any final thoughts you have on uh, the Enterprise incident? Only dun-dun-dun-dun. That's just <laughs> the coolest. I'm sorry. The coolest piece of music in the entire series, other than the main theme, is dun-dun-dun-dun. And you get a lot of that in that episode. Excellent, excellent. So, Vernon, uh, as always, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts and perspective on these 
original series episodes because we love your your take on these and we love uh, talking with you. So uh, we look forward to talking to you again as season three rolls on. My pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity and I apologize for my alcohol level. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Jeff, I guess I'll see you next Sunday. You definitely will. All right. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. Another tightly woven tale about war and strategy. This is the second appearance of the Romulans, whom we first met in Balance of Terror from our first season. We learned that they were hostile but honorable, smart and worthy adversaries. In some technological areas of warfare, the Romulans were even more advanced than the Federation. Here is the Enterprise Incident. If you think the real reason that the Romulans were using Klingon battlecruisers was because of the alliance between the two, think again. The main reason was that the show had invested heavily in the design and building of the Klingon model warship, and we had to justify the expense. Rather than spend more on a Romulan spaceship, it was decided to form this alliance to defray the cost. The ship made only three appearances throughout the original Star Trek series, but the design was closely adapted for use in the feature films. The cloaking device that Kirk steals away from the Romulans was supposed to be a pretty small item. In this episode, it's about the size of a table lamp, hard to tuck under a uniform. The device was made up of two pieces. They used the top of the space probe Nomad, which appeared in the Changeling, and then they attached it to the sphere that housed the conscious mind of Sargon in Return to Tomorrow. Another ingenious way to recycle props, uniforms, music, and special effects to get the most out of a creatively restrictive budget. <laughs>